God is a human word. It just means something we worship. There are gods. People have gods, 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 and gods. And that God in that Bible is telling us the whole time, I am your father. I am one. I'm Elohim. I am. I'm not one of these gods. I'm Jehovah. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the self-existent one, and I want to call you son. You know? And it just washed over me. I was like, man, what an honor. Not to refer to the Father God, Creator God as God, like any other common thing that people worship or whatever it may be, but to call the Creator of the universe, and I say universe, everything we know as cosmos or whatever it is, to call Him Father. It's just amazing. I mean, nobody invites you to do that. You know, you can't even get invited to... to to the president's house if you wanted to, you know, just think. But the creator of the universe has sought you and bought you with the body of his own precious blood. And he's, he's, he's just put it out there. I'm your father today. I've begotten you. You just can't understand that to go around calling him God. That's far away. God is something far away I don't really understand. It's a human word for whatever that is, Right? Father means something. It means I'm kin to. I live in the house with. I share the inheritance of. That's a whole different thing, isn't it? I've been wondering why it bothered me, and it just hit me the other day when I heard that. I was like, wow, I found, you know, I knew it had been bothering me in the spirit when somebody would pray and they'd say, God, I just pray. You know, but it never really, it never made sense until then. But he's not just some God. Not if you know him. You know, not if you know him. Um, but I, those of you here Wednesday, I want to finish something up. I left something out Wednesday. We were, we were in Revelation 17 talking about mystery Babylon the Great, the great harlot. I had to finish a word because I meant to do it, and I just didn't do it Wednesday. And there's one thing about mystery. You know, we talked about it, and it's written there, you know, obviously in Greek, and it says mysterion, mystery. And it obviously means mystery. And you don't have to go there, but it's in Revelation 17, probably about verse 6 or 8, somewhere like that. But um, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of all, yeah, and abominations of the earth. So this is the source of this whole spirit of harlotry and abomination in the earth. And mysterion is, is it does mean mystery primarily, but the whole point of this word, and it's so unique because we studied it there and we learned that this has been something that's going on since the beginning. All the way back in Genesis, there's been a spirit on the earth that's trying to set itself over the waters, over the peoples, right? And what's interesting about mystery, when you see it in big capital letters like that, it's the name, it's what God's calling her, Okay? And what he's saying is, mystery in this Greek, you look it up yourself, you'll be amazed, I think, to see it, but, and, and just surprised. The overall intonation there is like a secret society. It's a myst mysterion is something that exists behind the scenes and only available or only made known to those who are initiated. Only made known to the initiated. So there has been this spirit using men. And we talked about using really the spirit of witchcraft. Because witchcraft, again, is a work of the flesh. So men work, men or women, I say men, I'm talking about humans, work witchcraft, right? And they do it because they have a desire to exert some kind of authority or influence over others, right? And, and that's ungodly. Quite honestly, that, that's not of God. God created us all equal, and he wants us to stay in our place. I don't know if you've seen this commercial. There's commercial, and at the end of it, this guy looks at him and goes, hey, stay in your lane, bro. You know, it's kind of crazy. But if you think about it, if you think about it, that's what God really says to every human being. Hey, I made you unique. Now stay in your lane, bro. Don't take from somebody else. Don't take their position. Take yours. Possess what I created you for. Don't be trying to go over here and violate, you know. But every human being, every human being is trying to violate. We're trying to pull from somebody else to get for ourselves in the natural. That's kind of like what we do, right? And, we're, and if you're born again, 
If you're living by the Spirit, you're doing less and less of that. He says, if you live according to the Spirit, you'll not what fulfill the lustful deeds, right? The deeds of the flesh. And we know that witchcraft is a work of the flesh. In Galatians 5, it tells us. So that's kind of mysterion. I wanted to make sure I made it clear that this thing has been there. And people have known about it, just not the nations and tongues, not the oceans, only those initiated in the great harlot know. It's been the greatest thing perpetrated on the earth, used by Antichrist, used then ultimately by Satan to subvert the people. And it's been there since at least, and we can say probably all the way from the beginning, but at least we know since Nimrod and Babel the tower, right? If you think about it, it, you know, when you really understand that, it didn't even really have to be a physical tower. Everybody's looking for it. You know, you got archaeologists running all around the world. wonder where Babel is, man. What if Babel was spiritual? Most of the things in that book are, ultimately. At least they start out that way and their primary basis is, and then a lot of times they'll manifest in the natural. But Babel was an idea that we will put ourselves above all the other human beings. We'll rule and set ourselves over the other human beings. I want to tell you this. Do you realize Nimrod almost accomplished it? And it was so devastating to the earth that God had to stop it so that creation could continue until the time. And those of you who are here Wednesday night, isn't that something you think about it like that? It was so devastating. They were about to build the tower of confusion, mixture. You know, they were, they were almost there, and they were going to rule over the world. <laughs> and what would it make them? It would make them like gods. That was the point, right? It will make them like gods. And so there's a, there's, 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 a, there's a spirit that rules through men on the earth. And they believe they're like gods. And they believe it's their right to be over others. And, and generations of people have not known this, not seen this. And even when they see bits and pieces of it, they don't believe it. Why? Because it's hidden. It's a mystery. And generally, it's only revealed to those who are initiated in it. It's being perpetrated against good people, all the nations, tribes, and tongues. And it's all right there in Genesis 7, I mean in Revelation 17. It tells you all about it. Also tells you about her destruction. And we didn't get into that, but she's she's being judged. She's going to be judged. You know? And it's interesting that God said that this is who's been ruling over the kings of the earth. So you ask yourself in the world, and I'm going to end with this, we'll get into today, okay? But you ask yourself, because I know you have if you're a human being. You've looked at the news, you've looked at the things that go on in the world, and you said, How's this this don't make sense, man? This just doesn't make sense. Oh, and you say, this is just chaos, you know, right? No, it's not. It's just that a very few initiated people are controlling it. And it doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense to you. <laughs> right? I mean, if you, see, if you see Revelation 17, that's what you're seeing. And when we run up against it, because we don't know it exists, we always say, well, that can't be what it is. I mean, that couldn't be. It's got to be something else, right? And every time you run into it and you say, it almost seems as if, nah, <laughs> am I right? Yeah, sometimes it's like that, isn't it? You say, how could people do this? How could people not care about other people, right? Who are the people that could do this? Babylon. That's who. She has a name. God's named her. Babylon doesn't care. Babylon doesn't live like you. She doesn't think like you. She doesn't love like you. She doesn't respect her neighbor like you. And I'm not talking about like the Christian. I'm just talking like, like a regular person does. She's under the influence of a spirit that wants to put herself over everybody else. And that's everybody. We're all in the same boat if you're not in Babylon. But there's a, there's a spirit much like her that works in the church. Because Babylon, she's kind of really over the things of the earth, right? And there's another word for her that you'll see in Scripture. And you can find it in the end of Matthew 5, I think, of 1 Matthew 6. The real word for Babylon is called mammon. 
the way of the world or the commerce or trade of the world. If you look at, I think it's Ezekiel 28, where you find some imagery or metaphorical talk about Satan. And it's, he's speaking, I think, to the king of Tyre, but it's, it's kind of metaphorical of how Satan works. And he says, uh, you've corrupted yourself with the greatness of your trade, commerce. And then when you read Revelation 17, you see that she works by trade and commerce. That's her trademark, so to speak. That's how Babylon is perpetrated. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. In other words, they've taken part in this great trade deal to set herself up by money, fame, and power and whatnot over the peoples of the earth, right? So, but what you have is a spirit somewhat like that that seeks to do it in the church. Now, she's in Revelation 2, but she's in Revelation 2, uh, probably about verse 18 in the church of uh, Theatira, or Thyatira, however you want to say it, Theatira. And if you'll go there, it's Revelation um, just, well, let's go, just go, we'll start at Revelation 2.12 there. So you overcome Satan's death, the world and its system by the word of your testimony and the blood of the lamb and belief in it. Because none of us are seeing the physical blood of the lamb right now, right? We're believing in it, right? And because we believe, Apostle Paul said, we believe, therefore we speak amen good job we believe therefore we speak we don't speak what we don't believe that doesn't do anything you'll find christians that have not studied scripture and they'll hear somebody preach some it's not really in them and they'll say i'm gonna get that man i'm gonna start confessing that they won't get a thing because they're not speaking out of their belief they're speaking and there's not any belief you know the seven sons of sceva were going to cast the devil out and they said in the name of jesus Right? The only thing is, they didn't know Jesus. That devil beat them, beat them up till they were bloodied and naked, sent them out running. He wasn't worried about them. He said, I know those people you're talking about, but I don't know you. And since I don't know you, I'm not worried about you because I don't think you know Christ. Yeah. There's a war going on somewhere, isn't there? Amen. And we're winning it. Praise God. So. He who overcomes keeps my works till the end. In other words, we have to persevere till the end. That's why we say today is the day of salvation. Not I got saved 12 years ago because I didn't. I'm being saved today by my faithfulness and continuance to the testimony and faith in Jesus Christ. Right? I don't get to quit 12 years ago because I believed something once. That's not salvation. That's been preached. And that is a what the Bible calls a damnable heresy that will get people in trouble. All right, Ahab, the king of Israel, married Jezebel. And he married somebody outside the Hebrew faith. In other words, she wasn't saved. In, in New Testament terms, she wasn't saved, right? So what that automatically do? It brought her worship into his house. Let this be a word for the Christians, and we tell our young people, don't you date somebody that's not saved, you're not supposed to. Don't marry somebody that's not saved. I know the world, and most churches say it's okay. It is not. It will bring you problems. You cannot have a house that is divided and get anything done. You will never have a house that's divided and get anything done. It will cause you problems in your marriage, your kids, your finances, your life. When you're laying on your deathbed and your wife doesn't believe in healing, you'll die. Because she's one flesh with you. And I have sat for 20-something days at somebody's bedside and prayed that they be healed. And every day the wife come in and speak death over them without knowing it. Do not yoke yourself with somebody whose faith is not like yours. Please don't do it. And really, it's a sad thing. In most churches, they could care less. Most parents that are Christian parents could care less. What do they say? Oh, she's from a great family. I can hear it now. She's from a great family, you know, right? They're good people, moral people. They do this. Oh, they're very active in the community, right? You can hear them talking now. I want to know about your faith. I want to know if you're born again. I want to know, is Jesus the king? And I want to know, do you believe in marriage like Jesus believes in marriage? You know what I'm saying? I want to know those things because those are the things that's going to matter when the rubber hits the road, when everything's tough and it looks like divorce or it looks like somebody's going to die or it looks like we're going bankrupt, we're going to lose the house. Are we going to stay in one accord? 
If you brought Jezebel in, you're going to lose. Ahab brought her in. It did him in. I'm sure she was very beautiful. <laughs> you know, you think about it. You hear those preachers talking about me and my hot wife. I'm going to tell you what, you better make sure she's a faithful wife. And I'm not talking about to you, I'm talking about to him. Because there's one thing you can be sure of. If she's faithful to him, she'll be faithful to you. And if she's not by accident, she will at least be sorry. And she'll repent. And that's really all you can count on in this world, isn't it? Because nobody's perfect. But if somebody's heart is unto God and they'll repent, you can make it. And you're not going to find perfect people. But you can find people that will repent and submit to God. It's a very beautiful thing. <laughs> I can tell you, just only 10 years pastoring that that's one of the most beautiful things there is. It's not that people don't make mistakes. It's that they realize that God is king and they shouldn't have done it and they submit and they say, I'm sorry, and they mean it. It's real. It changes everything. And life can continue. <laughs> Isn't that great? But you find people that that's not true of. They just don't really care anymore. And generally, when you find somebody that doesn't care anymore, it's because they don't care about what he's saying. And it's sad. The penalty for being in church and being mixed up with Jezebel is you're not raptured out. You're going through the tribulation. But, and by the way, I've said this before, and we don't really have a teaching on it, but it's true. you got some churches believe that there's a rapture, some that don't. You have just some churches believe in a rapture and believe it happens at different times. Let me tell you this. This is why there are so many theories. Because some true Christians are not going to be raptured, and some are. They're all right. In other words, the ones who don't believe in a rapture, for whatever reason... They don't see it. They're not going to be raptured. They're going to go through the tribulation. I, I would submit to you, most of the times when churches have arguments over doctrine and they can't see each other's doctrine, there's a reason. They're not just all wrong. Conversely, a lot of times they're pretty much right. They're just in a condition and they don't know why. Does that make sense? Because your enlightenment comes with your condition. <laughs> Amen. So if you don't know enough not to follow Jezebel, then guess what? Your enlightened condition is probably that equal to somebody who won't know. Which means you wouldn't be raptured. But since you don't know, you wouldn't even believe in a rapture. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way that happens. I'm just putting that out there as a theory for you to understand why there are different beliefs. And that's also the main reason why belief shouldn't divide the church. As long as we all hold to the same belief, Jesus Christ is Savior, and he's the only way to the Father. Does that make sense? We actually should not divide over doctrinal differences. We should come together and test these things out. Because the division comes from a lack of knowledge. It's not coming because somebody's wrong and somebody's not. Because the Bible's clear that none of us know it all. It says, for we know in part. We see through a glass dimly. And so we know that nobody knows everything. And we need each other to get what we're supposed to get. Amen.